it's good to, to help individuals. It's good to come and do uh, charity work. But we want to do sustainable development. We want to make sure that every dollar we spend here uh, can have future benefit, not only to the students, but to also to their families, to future generations. That's why Empower Mali has a unique working relationship with the people here. There is no other organization that has the same integrated uh, relationship that is a three-way relationship where we don't hand out. The schools we build, the villages pay 20% of the cost of the school. They also provide the land for the school. But the government has to approve to send the teachers. But to encourage, because we are the only organization here in Mali so far that has not only electricity to the school, all the books necessary, but also teacher housing. So this makes it that teachers are no longer reluctant to come to this village, this remote area, because they have decent housing. They cannot afford a housing of this standing if they were in the, in the capital city. Is, are, tell me about when you were a kid growing up, this was not an option for you. Oh, no, no, of course not. Um, you know, um, education was even not a priority for most people at that time because uh, they were in a survival mood. Uh, when we were growing up, my father had to make a drastic decision to send all of us to school, which meant that we would sacrifice our comfort, which meant that we would sacrifice the labor, that we won't be able to participate in, in, uh, in, in the farm. So he made that decision at the cost of, of food security in our family. So we couldn't afford to have food. Some nights we'll go to bed empty, hand, uh, empty stomach. So it was very hard on us, but it was the price, the sacrifice we had to, to, to consent so that we can get an education. What did your mom do to help your aching tummy at night? James? Oh, <laughs> yes, my mother had, because at night sometimes we'll be so hungry that we couldn't sleep. Our stomach will hurt. So my mother will come and tie my stomach with a handkerchief so that it will shrink a little bit. I don't feel the pain of hunger. But in the morning, we wake up feeble, hungry, but yet determined to go back to school because we believe in our father's uh, uh, vision that only education will help us break the cycle of poverty. Are your parents still alive? Um, no, both parents passed away, um, you know, but I know that they, they see this. They know that the example, they have been an example for me, that um, we're building schools. We believe that every child deserve an opportunity to get educated because it will help them throughout the night. The, the, the number one foundation that we can build for development is education. It builds self-reliance. It builds, empowers communities and help families pull themselves out of poverty just like my family did. Today, all of my siblings had had the chance to have at least a bachelor degree. We've all been to school and now we are all self-sufficient and serving our communities. So it's not just helping one person, but it's helping him, his family and his community. So I invite anyone that is interested in uh, this development process to contact us. We have uh, board members. This is an all-volunteer organization. Every penny goes directly to building schools, uh, providing educational materials, or build, buying uh, Empower Playground from, from Utah and shipping it here in Mali. Yay, why, why do you do this? I mean, you could go to the United States and have a successful career and have a job there and have your kids go to school in the U.S. Why, why do you do this? I have been given much. I have been given so much. I come from exactly where these kids are. And it took tender mercies from individuals, friends, who took interest and invested in me. And the only way for me to pay back is to give back to my community. America does not need me. I may need America, but America does not need me. My village needs me. My country needs me. That's why I'm very passionate about serving the people here. Today I don't have to be here either. I'm now the ambassador of Mali to 10 countries in Southeast Asia, including India. But I have come to make sure 
that these efforts are sustained, that we may be able to send more and more children to school for my country to thrive, for children to be self-reliant, for families to have what they need. You were the mayor of Wela Sabuku for how, for what, from what year to what year? Uh, from 2009 to 2015. And, and how does it feel now to be to not be mayor anymore, to be living in India? Uh, do you miss your, your village? I do, I, I do. I, I know that being ambassador right now is um, a much bigger uh, opportunity to serve my country. But I certainly miss being mayor because I have invested so much. Taken my family out of the comfort of Utah and brought them here for the last six years serving the people of Mali. Uh, making sure that uh, education is attained by all of the communities. But making sure that this is a, a community effort, local participation. When I came as a mayor, less than 10% of the people trusted the local government. Thus, they would pay less taxes. So the first year, by creating the, the eldest quorum of the city, which is an instrument of communication, but also an instrument of reporting back to the community. I built trust, I built confidence, such that the first year, 68% of the people paid the taxes. The second year, 72. The third year, we got 100.74% paid, including back taxes. It, it sounds so surreal, but people believe, they knew that every dollar they pay is being used to uplift their community, to build schools, to pay doctors, to pay midwives, uh, to, to, to build uh, hospitals. With the money, they can see that they have now access to running water, they have access to electricity, that we have access to health centers in our own villages or in our own commune. This is what I really miss, working directly to make an impact in the lives of communities. So are you have plans in the future to come back to Mali and have a different path? Or? Uh, I hope so. I hope so. I, I, I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to run for president in 2013. Uh, I was not very successful, but uh, I was successful at making sure that I'm known throughout the country, that my, uh, uh, what I stand for is known throughout the country, that Mali is not condemned to poverty, that Mali is not condemned to lack of water or lack of educational infrastructure. We have the resources. What Mali is lacking is leadership with integrity. And I hope that one day I will have the chance to give to the whole country what I have given to my small community. Does this school have running water? No, this one does not have running water. They have a hand pump where villagers but also students can access to hand pumps. We have built a latrine, and, uh, but we're improving circumstances. So here. much nicer than the school in Bamako we visited <laughs> a couple days ago. Well, we try. We try to make it comfortable for teachers like uh, Fai that they won't stay, they will run away. The turnaround here was very, very uh, low. T teachers will come for one year. But today, I have one teacher here who came to me, Mr. Mayor, Please make sure they don't send me somewhere else. I would like to stay here in your school because I have access to a nice home for me and my family. And this is a very good environment for me. That's what I want to create. Everywhere you go in this country, people should enjoy serving instead of fearing uh, for housing or water, drinking water. We, we want to change that. Utah, so far away from Mali, a world away. Why would people watching this in Utah, why should they help somewhere so far away when they are so focused on Utah and helping Utah? What would you say to them? Why would they help Mali? We are all in this together. You know, um, doing good has no boundaries. Uh, money is as good as the good you do with it, as Pete Harmon, the founder of uh, KFC, would say. Uh, we, we believe that if you help these children here, they don't become vulnerable to violent extremist ideas. They become self-reliant. They, they raise families. They have hope. Only out of hope that human beings get involved into extreme violence. So we want to build hope. It doesn't matter where you are. Lack of hope, extremism, can affect lives in America, in Utah, anywhere in the world. The beginning is 
to empower communities where they live so that they don't migrate, so that they don't get involved and become vulnerable to extreme, extremist ideas. And that's what these kids can become if, if they don't have the, the basis of education and things. They, they're more vulnerable, as you're saying, to joining those groups. Absolutely, absolutely. Because they, they yeah, it's, it makes sense. They don't have any hope. You don't have anything to lose. So if someone gives you a little bit of money, sometimes families, women, watch their own children strapped into explosives for the immediate payment the, 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 all, the rest of the family will enjoy. What kind of despair will bring a woman to watch such a horror? But lack of options, lack of education, lack of hope. We want to bring that hope. We want to build, we want to empower Malians so that they will be strong. They will have something to protect. They will have their freedom to protect. They will have their family to protect. But they will have also their hope, hopes to protect. That's what we're doing by building schools, educating our young minds, and providing them with opportunities. Have you seen that happen before? Or have you heard of that happening? Have young people that just lost their way because they didn't have a good foundation? Most of the young people today that we see in the northern area, that we see in the street of Brussels, that we, we, we see in, in the attacks of Paris, they come from that kind of background. They come from families who couldn't provide or who didn't have hopes, where love was not the, the preoccupation. So we try to avoid that. We want to make sure that these children they know the innocence of being a child. They can play and not worry about their empty stomach. That they not, not, need not worry about the next lunch or the next dinner. So we want to make sure that these children are also healthy. That parents don't have to go do extreme things just to provide for a meal or health care for their families. One of the things that's been most shocking to us are seeing sick children in some of the villages. And not just that, but seeing, at least from our perspective, that the, the mothers don't seem that bothered by their child being sick. I mean, there was a, a woman at the village the other day who, she'd already lost three babies, she wasn't making milk anymore, the baby was malnourished, and she didn't seem all that concerned with it. Is that an educational issue? Is that a cultural thing? How do you talk about it? It's lack of hope. What option does she have? She doesn't. She's feeling the pain. It doesn't matter. Even a dog, even an animal, even a wild animal has concern and fears to see the, 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 the babies suffer. No woman will be at ease to see the children suffer. What would you do? You don't have money, you don't have medicine, you, can't, you don't even have food for yourself. It's hard to watch your child suffer by hunger. But these women are out of hope. They don't know what to do. They may look very uh, that they, they far away, that they, they're not concerned, but they're just out of hope. That is what it is. The the trash too. I, I asked one of the translators, I said, why is there so much trash? And he was kind of like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that you're upset by the trash. And I said, I'm not upset by it, I'm just asking you, why is there so much trash around? And he said, well, you're worried about yourself and you don't care about the community or anything. Do you think that's true? Or why, why is it like this? Uh, it's a lack of training, lack of inspiration. That's what I say, a leader is the one that inspires people to change their bad behaviors into good habits. We have to do that. People living in a rural area, we, live, we have lived so close to nature, and we, we were not used to all of these modern pollutants like plastic bags and others. So the management of these things also need training. We don't know what harms it does. So we need to educate our people. We also need to provide uh, infrastructure like uh, garbage cans where would you throw your banana skin and what educate people what 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 good does it make that we live in a clean environment what good does it make that we we protect our environment what is the correlation between that that garbage sitting in there 
and your health. People need to be taught and understand, they need to understand this before they change the, the habit of just throwing. Right now, I learned a new habit. I don't throw garbage around. I find a can and make sure it is, it is protected. So not everybody has that instinct. We have to build, build that into the people. We have to go through a process. So it takes time, but it can be done. Uh, people are concerned. They want to be healthy. But do they know that this garbage has a relationship with their health? Maybe not. They need to be educated for that. They also need to be sensitized about cleanliness, about taking care of their environment. Um, would you say that Utahns are, are the group that is helping Molly the most right now? Would you say so much help is coming from Utah? Or where do you see most of the help from the United States coming from? Uh, help is coming from Utah. Uh, we, we truly appreciate that. Utahns, uh, they're helping particularly the city of Willisiburgu, which is unofficially the sister city of Salt Lake City. Uh, Utahns uh, have, since uh, 1984, have been flocking to this place to support, to build wells, to dig wells, to make sure people have access to water. Uh, yes, they're doing a tremendous amount of medical work to, to help also donating money to build schools. Uh, the whole country of America, the United States is helping, but other places also, like European nations. Uh, Mali is one of the poorest countries on earth. Uh, as I said, we, we shouldn't be. Mali is the number one, uh, a third producer of cotton in, in, in Africa. Mali is one of the, the largest producers of cotton in the world. It tells you how hard we work here. But unfortunately, these natural resources are not being uh, translated into opportunities, into real possibilities for the people. It takes vision, it takes leadership with integrity to make sure that we are no longer dependent on foreign aid. That 50 years of foreign aid, 50 years of support from outside groups, we need to find our power within. We can do it. We have the ability to transform our life. We have the ability to, to provide, but it takes that leadership. And that is what we're seeking to, to bring to, the, to this country. Is it hard for the village to have 20% of the school? Very, very hard. The village that we received last night uh, a couple of nights ago, they spent one year to raise that money. But we don't want to hand out. We want them to struggle for the money so that they can take care of this building, so that to ensure that there is ownership. This is now owned by Empower Money. We partner with the village to build the school. We partner with the government to provide the teachers. We partner with people in Utah to provide all of the materials that will help make this an enjoyable learning experience. So uh, we want to make sure that this is provided everywhere in Mali. Where are all the jobs here? I, we were speaking with some of the translators. They're very well educated. They speak multiple languages. I think they're, they're your guys. Why, why is it so hard for them to find work here? They're so smart. That's part of the poverty we are in. That's part of the lack of job creation. Uh, we need, and Mali is uh, initiating some policies right now to strengthen uh, entrepreneur, the, the spirit of entrepreneur, entrepreneurship with the people. Making sure that it's easier for Malians to create jobs, to, to create uh, employment uh, or uh, their own enterprises. So we encourage also foreign direct investment from people all around the world. I say I will be receiving a delegation of Indian coming here to look into investment opportunities. They'll be investing in cotton, they'll be investing in mining, they'll be investing in renewable energy. All of this will create jobs. So governments usually are not the most successful uh, job creators, but they create the environment, they facilitate business community to, to come. And that's what we, we, we're trying to do. Yes, these young men, after education, they don't have jobs. So was, my, so was I. After graduation, I didn't have anything to do. I came back to my village and taught for three years as a volunteer. While I was doing this, I was blessed to be sponsored to go to America. 
and got more education and more jobs there. And now I'm here to help the government, to help the people uh, create more jobs. Each school we build here create at least 10 jobs. The teachers, the, 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 the community also selling food to, the, to those teachers. It, it creates opportunities for the whole village. So we are we're working on it, and I think that uh, um, we should make sure that all of these young men continue to get employed, have money, and build self-reliance. The status of the church here, how many members are there? Why is there no presence of the church here, and when, is, when can that happen? As, uh, as Elder Scott once told me, we have to wait for the Lord's timetable. I have been eager, and I have been working really hard. I have met with uh, President Holland. I have met with uh, uh, D. Christopherson. I met recently with uh, Elder Sitati. I met with uh, Elder uh, President Bednar to talk about the church in Mali. Many effort has been made to make sure that membership increases in Mali. Myself and my family were the only members for a number of times. It was very difficult for us, uh, lack of support and lack of opportunities for our children to attend primaries. All of this um, is making it harder for us. But I know, and we all know, that the gospel will be preached to all tongues and kindred. I have hope that the gospel will flourish in Mali. The effort is, that is being made, there's right now some young men from outside of the country, the other Malian being exposed to the church. There are hundreds of Book of Mormon now available. Uh, peop hundreds of people are hearing the message of our Savior. I know, I have no doubt that the gospel will thrive in Mali, that more and more people will come to understand. I personally have been, I have not been proselytizing in Mali, but I have been teaching the gospel through behavior. People wondering why Ye doesn't smoke, why Ye Samaki does not drink coffee, why do you not drink alcohol? Those are the things I uphold. Why do I strive to be honest in my dealings with others? Uh, why do I want to give back to my community? Why do I have such a sense of service? Those are things that are very noticeable by the people of Mali. So I am working hard with groups coming from Utah uh, and outside of Mali to make sure the people of this country can hear the message of our Savior, that they can see that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the solution for poverty. Is the solution for poverty in that it helps people behave in a way that is it, it prevents them from in, engaging into corruption. And corruption is the number one reason why Mali is lagging in development today. It helps us also prevent diseases, and it, it helps us through habit to be healthier. So all all all, all those things are needed here in Mali more than they are in Utah. So we, I believe, as the gospel has transformed my life, as knowing that Jesus Christ has come on earth to serve me and sacrifice for me, that inspired me to give to others, to serve others. And I know that every Malian would like to learn deep down. But one thing is clear to me. People are hungry and thirsty for the knowledge of our Savior. We need as members to be bold because we have what they need, the gospel. As uh, uh, Pre President Irene said it in the last conference talk, we need to be bold about what we have because the world needs it, which is our religion, which is the world of our Savior, which will help transform lives. And this is what is happening in Mali. I have the membership is growing. We have a, approximately three to five members, but we have a lot of people coming from Utah uh, joining us. We have probably more than 40 uh, members of the Church of Jesus Christ in Mali today. We have more than 20 priesthood holders in this country today. What a joy! What a blessing for our country. The Spirit of the Lord is here in Mali. Do you believe that it'll happen in your lifetime? That it'll be officially established? I have strong hope. And I have indication that it will happen not, not, not in, in a very far uh, uh, future. It should be happening. And I know that. And, you know, I feel terrible that I enjoy the presence of 
a branch in India that my children now go to primary and learn of Christ. Well, what a marvel would it have been for children here to have primary experience, to learn of Jesus Christ when they were just uh, little kids. How, how was it for you being the very first member in your whole country and being the only one alone in that faith for so long? How is that? I don't know. The Lord is just, the, He has mysteries. I always felt part of the flock, even far away. Uh, the support of my wife, who loves, is a, who loves Christ, and my children have learned uh, the gospel. But, you know, having just a sacrament in our home every Sunday, not being able to have a regular church was very hard. It was very hard. But for some reason, we have been kept in the presence of the Spirit. We have always felt the Spirit in special moments in our home. We didn't need to be in the congregation to feel that. But our dedication to our faith, it has been spoken of. I was elected mayor in a community of 90% Muslim, knowing that I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I run for president in this country. I have never at one time been prosecuted, even in the midst of military coup. I have never felt that my life is in danger because of my faith. So Mali is a very tolerant country. Tolerance is a way of life here. Catholics, Jehovah Witnesses, Protestants, and Mormons, even if it's just me, will live together in harmony with their violence. There have been a time where some people have misused religion for the economic reasons, as what we have seen in the northern area of Mali. But that does not define us Malians as a people. That is just a punctuated event that happened, and we will defeat that. We will tell the world that we embrace diversity, that we embrace freedom of religion, that we embrace freedoms and liberty in this country.